Yeah, my name is Bert Beckwith, and I used to be someone. Um, used to be on the Grails team. Um, used to be important, and now I'm just like you guys. <laughs> um, so I'm doing some Grails consulting and uh, stuff like that. So, um, yeah. So little did he know. It's kind of a strange sentence, a little strange phrase, and I think it doesn't translate well into other languages. Um, but it's, uh, it's a phrase from this movie, Stranger Than Fiction, which is one of my favorite movies. And it has nothing to do with programming or technology or anything like that. Um, but it's a funny, um, it's just an amazing movie. Will Ferrell plays a, it's, a, it's not really a comedy. Um, and the basic story is uh, that there's a writer who is writing a story, and um, Harold Crick is the actual main character in the, in the book. And one day he starts hearing a narration of what he's doing in his head, and he thinks he's going crazy. But it's actually the author, uh, as she's writing the book, and he hears her voice in, in his head. And uh, so he thinks he's going crazy, and he ends up, eventually he goes to a psychiatrist, and he ends up at a um, university t talking to a literature professor. professor and that's uh, played by Dustin Hoffman. And the phrase that sort of... Uh, tips the scale and kind of makes it, gets them to realize what's actually going on is that he heard her say, little did, he, little did he know that this simple, seemingly innocuous act would result in his imminent death. When he told that to the professor, that said, did you say little did he know? I've written papers on little did he know. I love that concept. I used to teach a class based on little did he know. I gave an entire seminar on little did he know. So it's this, it's this great phrase. And so the reason that I use that as the title for the talk is that as I was, you know, I spent a lot of time on Stack Overflow answering questions because, you know, it's nice to give back, but it also helps me to learn things. And, and it's like a, I always think of it as sort of a constant stream of puzzles that I get to solve. And uh, sometimes, you know, I am shocked at how dumb some of the Stack Overflow users are that they don't seem to know anything. <laughs> it's very frustrating sometimes. Um, but I would just I would I would I would see something and I would realize wow that's pretty cool people don't know this uh, or I'd learn something and I'd say I didn't know that and um, so this, so that phrase little did he know was sort of I kept hearing that in my head as I would discover some cool weird sort of edge case thing or something like that so that's basically the uh, the motivation behind the, the title so basically the talk is uh, a bunch of small uh, not very related um, ideas uh, concepts that I think are interesting and uh, hopefully will help you um, write better Grails applications. So, and, and Groovy apps, of course. So um, the map constructor, we use it all the time. We use it uh, for, um, in Grails extensively and it's so convenient. And in fact, we, you know, in, in Java projects, you tend to create lots of constructors for your objects because you kind of have to. So if you have a lot of fields, um, typically you'll create a constructor and then you'll add more stuff and maybe you add a second constructor because you know, you want a three hour constructor and a five hour constructor, and then you need the 10 hour constructor. And you don't want to create a lot of constructors, so you end up having maybe a few of them. And like the 10 hour constructor, you end up creating, you know, new person, pren, uh, Bert, comma, Beckwith, comma, true, true, minus five, null, 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 seven. And, uh, and then at some point, maybe you say, well, let's create a constructor that doesn't have the, all those nulls in it or something. And, we don't worry at all about this. You almost, you almost never create constructors in Groovy or Grails because we don't need to. We can just use the map constructor. It's so great. But there are times when you do want to use a constructor because if an object only makes sense if some or all of its uh, important fields are set, then you want a constructor that does that so that the object is, is always valid. Um, and so you can enforce some constraints, some logic constraints, you know, business rule constraints or, or database constraints, things like that. Um, so it's possible to create constructors, it's just that you don't have to, usually. So let's talk about how the map constructor even works. Um, actually, quick, quick quiz. Do any of you feel like you really get the map constructor and you really know how it works under the hood? Or do we just use it and we just don't think about it? And, and, uh, does anyone really feel confident that they, they understand the map constructor? Not a, I see Jeff Brown is raising his hand and that was not unexpected. When I gave this talk in Madrid, uh, Jochen Theodoro, of course, raised his hand and just said, yes, I understand how that works. Um, so it isn't a constructor, in, in, for real. It's, if you decompile the code, it's not there. 
It's actually implemented, if you want to look at how this is done, um, there's a Metaclass Simple Invoke Constructor uh, logic, it has some logic there, and then there's also, there's the, you know, the call site caching, so there's a different uh, version of it there over uh, in the uh, constructor side, call constructor, uh, but they're basically the same implementation. And the way that it works is it depends on the fact that there's a default constructor, so it creates a new empty instance of the class, and then it calls metaclass simple dot set property, set property, set property. So you, you have a map that says, you know, first name colon Bert comma last name colon Beckwith. And so it's going to find a property called first name. And it's going to uh, call the setter the set first name and set last name uh, in, uh, methods. Um, so it's really just, it's, there's nothing fancy there. It's just really kind of a uh, smoke and mirrors. It's just a syntactic sugar to make things easier for us. Um, and there is going to be a default constructor typically because if you don't create any constructors at all, the Java compiler, this is an Groovy thing, uh, the Java compiler will create an, an empty constructor because you have to. You have to have some constructor in every class. So if you create one or more constructors of your own, uh, with or without parameters, however you want, then the, default, the Java compiler will not create an empty constructor. Um, but if there are none defined explicitly in the class, then you always get one. That's true in all Groovy and all Grails classes, uh, all Groovy and all Java classes. So, but what about domain classes? It actually is different in domain classes. So Grails uses an ASD transformation and adds in a default constructor. And then because that's there, the Java compiler doesn't have to create it. And the reason that that's there is for dependency injection. So uh, for uh, one, one use case for using dependency injection in a domain class is to inject in a service. So let's say you have some complicated business logic and you don't want to put that in your domain class. Uh, you can, um, but maybe it gets really kind of big and complicated. Or maybe you're using that in a couple different places. For whatever reason, you move it into a service. Um, so then you can dependency inject the service back into the domain class, and then inside of a, inside of a custom validator, you can call that method in your service and, and, um, and use that. So, and there's other reasons to use dependency injection, but that's the one that I've done the most. Um, and the way that that works is that um, Grails creates a constructor that creates the instance and then looks for injectable properties um, and you know, calls the spring code to do the dependency injection and inject your beans. So that's a really cool thing that, that happens. So it turns out that um, Grails creates that empty, its own empty constructor. And that becomes important here in a minute. So I was playing, I was adding, I've been trying to for I feel like forever, uh, trying to get the new uh, Spring Security 2 plugin released. And one of the things, one of the changes that I made in the, in the generated domain classes is that, because I create uh, Spring Security apps all the time, test apps. You know, Grails create app, delete me, install the plugin, do some stuff, test it, and delete it. I'm, co I'm constantly creating and, and destroying little test uh, applications. And especially in Spring Security, I'm always creating a new user, pren, username, colon, admin, comma, password, colon, Password, comma, enabled, colon, colon, true, save. And then role, new role, authority, colon, role, admin, save. Um, so I wanted to create just a regular constructor that was just, you know, new user, pren, bert, comma, beckwith, save. Um, so I did that, but then weird things happened. And I got lucky because it failed, and it, I'm, much, I'm glad that it failed early rather than failing when people were trying to use it. So uh, we can create a constructor if you want. Now, in this case, there is no, there's not going to be a default constructor created by the, Groovy, by the Java compiler because you have one, at least one constructor. So there is no default constructor in this domain class. But there is. Um, so let me back up a little bit. So now I can create this object by using its constructor. But if I want to be able to use the map constructor, or if I want to be able to just use the empty constructor, I've got to remember to create an empty constructor because it's not going to be automatically generated. Except, thank you. So um, it turns out that there is a, a, an empty constructor in there because of the ASD transformation. And it's the one that does dependency injection. So if I use this constructor and I add in def data source or def uh, user service or something, that dependency injection will start failing because I created my own custom constructor. Um, so what I have to do then is I have to call this. 
If I do that, and that looks weird because there is no empty constructor in the code to, to call. So this should fail, right? This looks like it'll fail to, run, to work at runtime. Um, it turns out that that works very, very well um, because the, the constructor is actually there. So, um, so all, if, you, if you use the, uh, the next release of the uh, Spring Security plugin, you'll see that all the generated domain classes use that. Um, so all you have to do to remember is that, and this doesn't apply to anything except domain classes. So in domain classes, if you want to create your own customized constructors, you just have to remember to call this as, as the first line. And then what that does is, is it calls the AST uh, generated um, constructor for you and does any dependency injection. And so if you don't, if you don't need dependency injection, you can, you can probably skip that. So I thought that was kind of fun to, when I, when I was playing with that, it failed on me. And, and uh, so I started digging into the groovy code and I had a little did you know moment. So pretty cool stuff. So uh, let me also say that if um, this isn't heavy duty stuff at all, but if there are any questions, please uh, interrupt and we'll, we'll, we'll probably have some time at the end also, but uh, feel free to, to uh, raise your hand or, or ask questions. Okay, so like I said, these, some of these are pretty minor topics, but uh, please don't do this. It's not a big deal, it's not a performance killer or anything like that, but you're creating a new date instance to get the time in milliseconds. But th and then you throw away the data, data instance. Um, you know, you, and that's an example of how you might use it. You do some timing, right? So you, you uh, get the initial time, you do some stuff that takes a while, you get the current time, you subtract, and that's how, that's how long it took. Um, it's much better to just call system get current time millis, because that's what the date constructor is using anyway. So that's a, that's a pretty minor thing. So foo ID. So we have a domain class here and we have a many to one relationship. So a book has an author. So of course book author is probably more like more appropriate as a many to many, but let's pretend it's many to one. So author is another domain class and Grails, Gorm, Gorm of course wires everything up for us conveniently. Um, but if I want to get the ID of the author, for some reason, to use as a foreign key or for any reason. Um, I can call book.author.id, but what that's gonna do is, as soon as I call .author, if that hasn't been resolved yet, by default, uh, many to ones and uh, many to many's are lazily loaded. And you can change it to be eagerly loaded, but you know, we, uh, often we don't. So as soon as I call a property on that author instance, it's going to, if, it's, if it hasn't been initialized yet, it's going to go to the database, load the instance, and then initialize it and get the data. But if all you needed was the ID, that's really expensive. Because the object there is actually, if this is lazily loaded, it's actually a proxy. And the proxy is a Hibernate concept and it creates a subclass of the class at runtime, stores the ID in the proxy instance, so that when you call a property on it, it has the ID in there and it can go to the database and load the on-demand, it can load the data. Um, so the ID is in there somewhere we don't necessarily know how to get to it because it's inside of a CG lib proxy and you know, it's, it's, uh, there are dragons in there. So, um, but there's a, this really cool author ID dynamic property that I'm pretty confident is not mentioned anywhere in the Grails documentation. Um, and uh, it's just the property name and then capital ID. So it's not settable, it's only, it's only uh, readable. Um, and that's a great way to, um, if you wanted to do a SQL query or for any reason, if you want the ID of the Refer uh, the referenced object, uh, that foo ID is the way to go there. So I will be putting up a, uh, there's not a lot of, I'm not going to do any code demos here. Um, and there's not a lot of code to even show, but I will, I, I'm going to be putting this code up in, uh, in a uh, GitHub repo so you guys can, can download it. But if you run this, um, you'll see that, so we create two authors, and then we create a book that references one of the authors, and I'm using load, again, because that creates a proxy. If I were to use get, of course this is in the session, but if I use get, it's really a waste because it's going to load the object from the database just to get its ID for the foreign key and then throw it away. So load is, is very efficient. So load and, and that foo ID property are, are, are two ways of you know, working with the ID without actually wasting the time of actually loading the instance from the database and then throwing it away. Um, so we create two authors, create a book that references one of them, and we, clear, we flush the session to make sure everything's pushed to, the, pushed to the database, and then we clear the session. Now we load the book again. 
and we'll see the SQL for loading the book. Of course, that ha you know, we're using get, so we're going to see a select from book where ID equals one. So we can print the book's properties, the title, the published, um, but if you'll see that when you call print line beta author ID, it will not call a select from author where, because that's using cached data. But here, when I say print line b.author.id, which is the same value, you'll see the SQL query in the output for loading the author. So that's a concrete example. So you can actually see what's going on there. You can see why this is a, a savings. And if author just has two columns in it, then it doesn't, it's not very expensive. But if it's a domain object that has lots of wide strings and lots of fields, and you're loading this gigantic, potentially gigantic object uh, over the wire from your database server to your web server, only to then throw it away because all you needed was its ID. That's really wasteful. And that's a, one very small thing, but if you do that a lot, that's going to add up and it's going to slow down your application. And then you're going to complain because Grail sucks, it's really slow, and it turns out that you're the problem, not, we're not the problem. I see this code a lot, and I don't know why anyone would ever do this. Can anyone think of a reason why this might do anything good at all? If I call save, if I just say if foo.save, save calls validate, right? We know that. And so the save method in GORM um, returns either the, either the thing that it was invoked on, if, if, it, if the validation succeeded and it saved it to the database, or null if validation failed. So um, if validation failed, then we can call get errors and we can see what happened and we can you know, uh, figure out what, what went wrong and fix the validation errors, set the properties that were missing or whatever. So calling validate and then save, you're gonna do validation twice. That's probably not that expensive, but if you have a custom validator that does something that's moderately expensive, or if you're really going nuts and you have a validator that maybe does a web service call or something, you're gonna make that call twice. Again, it's probably not that expensive, but it's just, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So um, don't do that. Please don't do that. OK, so we can use primitive types, of course, in domain classes. We can use numbers and booleans. And, um, as well as more complex objects, you know, other domain classes and, and um, things that have uh, custom serializers that uh, Write to the data, you know, go, go to the uh, results set and actually do the, or go to the, you know, the prepared statement and actually do the saving. Um, but be careful with primitives. So it turns out that there's a pretty big difference between capital B boolean and, and lowercase b boolean and int and integer long and long. So what happens is if you have a, a uh, domain class and you have a, a let's say a boolean um, active and int count, right? Um, so those are going to be initialized. When you create a new empty instance of that class, primitives get initialized to a, an initial value. So zero for numbers and, and false for uh, booleans. But um, objects are always, they're never initialized to anything. So a capital B boolean will be null until you set it, and a capital I integer will be null. So what happens is we get some weird, some, some pretty weird things happen. So um, if zero is a valid choice, um, then we don't know if the zero was there from the constructor and the user didn't know in your UI to set a value or if they actually chose zero. You can't really know um, if it was, uh, well, you can, but it's a little complicated. But in general, it's hard to know if uh, the user set it or if it was just, they're just accepting the default and they didn't know about something. Same thing with false and true. Um, so booleans really are true or false, but there's really three states. It's true and false and no value yet, because I don't know what the value is yet. So um, furthermore, if the database column is nullable, and it's certainly valid to um, have a nullable number column, nullable boolean column, um, if you have a, an int type and you store a null in the column, when you, when you retrieve that instance from the database, zero and null are not equivalent in general. They may be equivalent in your application. Same thing with false and null for a Boolean. The default f uh, for the Boolean may be false, but null, I haven't chosen a value yet, and false, 
I chose it and it's not true, um, are, are very different in most, most of the time. So um, there's, uh, it doesn't make sense to default to zero or default to false. So you'll get a null pointer exception because there's a null number and you can't store a null number in a primitive int or a primitive boolean. You can't store a null boolean inside of a primitive. So, uh, so given the fact that it's hard to know who made the changes, like I was saying before, and then the nullable column issue, um, it makes a lot more sense in general to use the object types for, for these. It turns out though that Hibernate does something kind of cool. And if you have a nullable primitive type, Hibernate, when, you, when it creates the DDL to do the schema export, to do the, actually creating the database, so I'm, I'm assuming here that you're not using database mi migrations here, you're just using the create drop sort of thing. Hibernate will create that column as not null because of this problem. Because it knows that you've got a, a, an int or a bool lowercase b boolean, and it knows that it'll fail at runtime, so it'll create a not null column and it'll force you to set a value. And that's great because it's, it's what you wanted, probably, but now you're, you're consistent. You told Hibernate to do one thing and it didn't do that for you. It did what you, not what you asked it to do, it did what you needed it to do. So that inconsistency is, is not cool at all. Um, it's great because it helps you, but it's bad because you don't necessarily know that it's happening. So if you just use the integer long capital B boolean, um, then everything sort of works and it just makes a lot more sense. If the column isn't nullable, and if maybe zero is a good default value, then use uh, primitives, but just think about what you're doing when you're using these. Um, all right, so this is a huge pet peeve of mine, and I don't know why this bothers me as much as it does, but I hate this. Find by ID. It's a very natural thing, it's very intuitive, right? Find by ID, it's, it's, uh, it reads in English, you know, the dynamic finder um, concepts are very sort of fluent, I mean, they're, they're very readable. So find by ID and get are basically the same thing, right? You're, you're getting the one row that has that ID or null if there isn't a row with that ID. But it turns out that find by ID is not a special method. It's, just, it's a dynamic finder just like any other finder. It's, it's basically the same thing as find by first name or find by height or find by whatever. It's find by some property. There's nothing special about find by ID. It's just a regular dynamic finder. Dynamic finders are cached very, um, very strangely. So um, click this link. This is a great article. It was written in, I think, 2007. But it's still, the information there is still completely valid. So just very quickly, um, if you, um, you create an instance, say a, a person, right? And you then load it, find by ID, five. Uh, you get the you get the you get that that object back again, and if you turn on query caching because it's off by default, and you uh, use whatever the flag is for your query to you know uh, to make that cached, then the next time you load it, it'll load from the cache. So that's cool, right? If it's cacheable and it's cached, but it turns out that all dynamic finders, well, all queries. Um, that return uh, one or more instances. If I then create a new person, or if I edit an existing person, or if I delete a person, Hibernate is going to clear the cache query results for everything that has anything to do with person. Because it can't know if the new thing that you just did, if you, the new thing you just created, um, it's, it's, it makes more sense for find all by whatever. Um, but it's true for find by also. So it can't know that the thing that you deleted or the thing that you um, added or the thing that you edited would have affected these queries. And it's programmatically very, uh, very hard problem to, to do that. And it's impossible when you consider that a trigger at the database could have done something really weird there. So they are pessimistic. And whenever you do anything, you, when you create a new instance or delete or edit, it flushes the cached results. And if you have a, a table like a person where you create and edit and delete fairly often, then you're going to be constantly retrieving instances, caching them, and flushing them because you added the new one. So you retrieve, cache, flush the cache, retrieve. So you might as well just go to the database every time. And it's actually more expensive to cache it because you're wasting all that time caching it when you, you, when you could have just uh, gone directly. 
And it's even more expensive in a cluster because you're going to be replicating that cache results around to the cluster. So it can, you can really kill your performance by turning on caching. You know, very counterintuitive. But get is special because it knows that you're getting the one instance by ID. And it knows that if you've got ID, the instance with ID 5 and you deleted the instance with ID 6, so that has nothing to do with it. If you create a new one and it's got ID 570, that can't have anything to do with ID 5. If you edit the one with ID 7, that has nothing to do with the one that has ID 5. So Hibernate can cache get uh, results very aggressively, very intelligently. So given that they basically do the same thing, but uh, get caches much more intelligently, there's, I, don't, I cannot think of, and maybe some of you can, but I cannot think of any reason why you would ever use find by ID. Now, find by ID and some other property um, is valid. And um, one of the examples I, I gave in one of the um, Spring Security talks that I did is that um, for simple situations where ACLs would be overkill, um, an example that I use is a credit card, for example. So if I look in my URL and I see that I'm, I'm reading my, I'm looking at my purchases for my credit cards, um, and I see, you know, uh, server name slash uh, credit card slash five, right? So the, that's the syntax, Grail syntax for, you know, get the instance with ID five. Um, I can turn that into a six and load it, and now I can see your credit card. And I can turn it into a 27 and I can see your credit card, if you did it wrong. If you just trust the, the user and you load whatever they, they ask you to load, then it's a gigantic security risk. So what you want to do is you want to say, instead of get pren ID, you'd want to say find by ID and user, because you've already authenticated. And if I do the query so that the ID has to match and the foreign key to the user table also has to match, then if, if the ID is correct and it matches something, but the user ID doesn't match, then it's going to return null. So a combination find by ID does make sense in some cases, but find by ID I don't think ever makes sense. So f scan your code when you get home and look for all those and uh, turn those into gets. All right, so this has nothing to do with code and almost nothing to do with Grails, but um, I don't know anything about licensing. I, I, just, I just use uh, Apache and, and uh, don't worry about it. Um, I have a huge respect for Stallman, but um, I'm not a zealot, and uh, I'm not a lawyer. So, but I, um, Craig um, Burke did this really cool uh, Groovy document builder project. And um, I saw some tweets, and it looks really interesting. And there was a thread, yeah, if you click that link, there's a, a, um, a, a, Twitter, a tweet thread where somebody jumped in and, and uh, kind of told him that you know, he's violating a license, and then, um, What's the guy's name? The uh, iText guy uh, jumped in also. Um, and so that led me to, down this path of reading licenses. And it turns out that if you use, if, this applies more to um, sort of plugins if you're releasing something as software than if you're creating an application. But it affects you too, and I'll come back to that in a sec. Um, if you're using an ASL project, an Apache project, you cannot use GPL libraries. That's really weird. I, uh, it turns out I almost never use GPL libraries, not because I choose not to, but because most of the stuff that I use just happens to be Apache licensed. But you can't. And if you click that link, the Apache uh, link, they explain why, and it's really crazy. Um, and it turns out that you can't even use GPL3, which is the good one, because even linking to a GPL3 project is considered a derivative work because lawyers got to get paid. So um, think about licensing when, when you're doing this stuff. And so we use uh, iText quite a bit. It's a great library. Bruno Logi did amazing work. It's old. He, he's, he did a book on it. And uh, it makes programmatically creating PDFs dead simple. It's so great. And there's also uh, uh, libraries on top of iText that make it even simpler or do other cool things. So in Grails, we, um, we generate the uh, PDF version of the uh, docs. And uh, so that's nice because you can download it and you can have it, read it on your phone, you can print it out or whatever, and you can search, which is kind of the nice thing. And uh, there's the export plugin, which, ha which uses this library. So it can be very easy to, and it has support for exporting a GSP to a PDF, which is really slick. 
But if you're using it, you're most likely violating a license. Because what we do is we cheat. And he switched to, um, it's dual licensed. It's GPL, I forget which GPL, and AGPL. AGPL, I hate that license, it's evil. And a lot of commercial um, software that has a free version uses AGPL. And the reason that they do that is they're trying to force you to, 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 to pay for it. Because you can use the free version um, w as long as you use the AGPL license. But AGPL is evil. GPL is viral, and you can, you, know, you can believe whatever you believe about it, uh, whether it's uh, good, bad, terrible. Um, I tend to lean towards that last one. But AGPL is, is evil because it forces you, even in a web application, to uh, open source your application. If you use an AGPL li license, you have to make the source code of your web application, your GSPs, your domain classes, uh, you have to open source it. How many of you have a manager who would be really excited if you open source your application to tomorrow? So you're then going to switch over and buy the paid version, which gets you support and all that stuff. That's cool. So what we do is we cheat. We go back to the last version of the, of the library that um, doesn't have all the cool new fixes and all the cool new features, but we use the one that's appropriate to use, the one that used the old license, the, the Apache-friendly license. But it turns out you can't do that because lawyers got to get paid. And I, I, sh I, I recommend you, you click through and read that because basically what he did was he went through and spent a ton of money on lawyers to scour the code and to make sure that they weren't violating licenses. And you have to do the exact same thing. You cannot benefit from his research into what the licenses, how the license worked and, and uh, what violations happened. You have to do your own thing. So if you want to use any version of iText, either the new one, so you've got to pay for it, or the old ones, you'd have to do the same lawyer research that he did, basically, to make sure you're not in violation. Or you can just be a criminal. Um, and you may be fine with pirating a movie because you know, they're going to make $300 million and, and the $7 or the $15 that you would have paid for the movie is the drop in the bucket and you don't care about that. But we should not be stealing from other developers. So um, pay for your uh, iText license um, or use a different library. But trust me, <laughs> there's not much out there that e doesn't either wrap iText or suck. Um, so uh, yeah. All right, so logging libraries. So I really like SLF4J, it's really slick. So uh, Log4J, of course, is the, the big, big player in the, in the space. And um, so Log4J 1.2 is the one that we, uh, we mostly tend to use. And it's great, but it's, uh, there's definitely some performance problems. So there's some blocking code in there, and, and uh, at really high, uh, high usage, um, it's, it's going to become, there are bottlenecks in there that are going to be problematic. And I know that Netflix did a, uh, a, their own kind of custom version of that where they fixed a lot of those issues. And then, since then, the Log4j 2 um, basically did a rewrite of the project to do that same thing. So it's, Log4j 2 is, is great. So it's got the same basic API as Log4j 1, um, but it's fixed all those internal um, issues, internal bottlenecks, and added, added some other new, cool new features too. Um, and then uh, Logback is from uh, the guy who wrote uh, Log4j. So it's similarly performant and got great features and all that. So we use Commons Logging or SLF4j as a wrapper library around the logger so that we can then, so that we can use the, the wrapper library and then we can switch out the underlying implementation. So you could switch from Log4j to Logback or Log4j2 or, or even uh, uh, JDK logging um, if you wanted to. And then you don't have to change your code because you're just using the commons logging um, loggers or the SLF4j loggers. Um, but it turns out that, that um, it, you can actually uh, cause yourself performance problems by switching from log4j to SLF4j or uh, any of these. So if you look at log4j, the, the, you, know, so you say log.debug, whatever. So the, the, the two um, important variants, there's, there's a few others. But there, you know, there's, of course, there's debug more and error, you know, all those. Um, but they typically, typically the ones that you use are the one that take uh, the message to be logged and then optionally uh, an exception to print the stack trace for. And the type in the method, if you look at the Java doc in Log4j, it takes an object. So you can pass in whatever you want and it'll turn it, in, it'll call it basically to string if it's not null. And uh, it'll, it'll um, 
render the string, string version of that thing. So if it was already a string, you're good to go. Um, if it's a g-string, it converts it to a string. If it's a list, it takes the two-string of it. Um, so commons logging, log4j1.2, log4j2, except object. But log, logback, which is a, lib a real logging library, and slf4j, which is the other wrapper library, have string as that first type, which shouldn't be a problem because you can either log strings or manually convert it to a string yourself, or if you use Groovy, it'll just convert it for you. But what if we do this? What if we have a g-string where the things variable is a large collection of objects, and we're debugging it? So we would assume that that wouldn't do anything because we're at, you know, the level for that logger is info or warn or whatever. So we're at debug, so we're not going to do anything, right? No, we are going to do something. Because since if we're using SLF4J or logback, that object, g-string is not a string. It doesn't extend string. String is final. Groovy just pretends it's a string. It does a lot of uh, syntactic sugar and magic for us, but it is not a string. Um, that has to get converted to a string. Groovy will do that for us, and it will create the massive string from that g-string, send that down to the debug method, then the debug method is going to see that it's uh, at info or warn or whatever, and it's going to throw it away. It's going to kill you because you, you know, you, we assume that our debugging is not costing us anything in production because in production we're at, we're at warn or we're at error. But this is incredibly expensive. So it's going to slow you down, and you're going to get these weird performance hits, and you're going to be like, Where, why is this so slow? Grail sucks. Why, are we, why does Grail not perform well? You're the problem. So um, SLF4J has this really nice placeholder support. So you can put just empty brackets. Don't put a dollar sign there, because it's not a g-string. So for every uh, bracket set that's in there, um, you can give it one or more arguments, and it'll just replace those in there. Now, this is cool, because this uh, collection could be gigantic. But now we're passing down just a plain old string. It's got two braces in there, but that doesn't make it a g-string or anything like that. And I could have used sing single quotes there. I probably, probably should have used single quotes there. So now I pass down this tiny little string and this massive collection. Now I check the debug, I, and we say, nope, we're at info, we're at error, and we throw it all away. No cost, except for the cost of doing those little lightweight checks. So be careful of your logging if you're switching to a, a wrapper library. The alternative is to just realize that you're never probably going, to, probably going to switch your implementation libraries. So don't use a wrapper library at all. Just use logback, or just use log4j2. Or you know, if you're old school, use log4j1.2. But if you are using a wrapper library, either Commons Logging or uh, SLF4j, be very careful. And so I, I put all the links to all the Java docs for all the different implementations, the, the implementation libraries and the wrappers, so that you can see whether they're object or string. And, and it's important to, to be aware of what's what. Yes, question. Right, right, exactly. So the, the question was, that, uh, the, the point was that um, you can number the, the placeholders in log4j, which is kind of nice because then the order doesn't matter and you can reuse them. So you can, you can have something in two places. Um, and uh, so, again, yeah, you, it, the logback syntax is, is different from log4j, and it's not a one-to-one -one conversion. So you have to, yeah, be aware of all the little uh, intricacies of, of the different uh, libraries. That's a, that's a really good point, thanks. So uh, semicolons and public have no place in Groovy, right? There are very few cases where you'd want to use semicolons. Um, and you just almost never want to use public, because public is the default scope. So why say it? You know, don't clutter your code with unnecessary keywords. Um, and uh, you know, I like my Groovy code to be compact. I mean, that's par partly why we use it. We want to not spend so much time with all the ceremony of all this crap. We just want to get our jobs done. Um, but it turns out that you want to use public when you're using constants. And the reason for that is that we, you have to remember that when, um, when you have a, a property in a, in a Groovy class, like, f for example, uh, the one we use this most in, I think, in Grails is in domain classes. So we have class person, and then we have uh, string first name, string last name. You know, let's say a really simple domain class, right? 
no constraints, no mapping, no whatever, just two properties in a domain class. Um, that class, not because it's a Grails class or a domain class or anything, because it's just a, it's a Groovy class, what's going to happen, the compiler's going to convert that string first name into a private string first name field, a real field, because these aren't fields, these are properties, a very different thing. So it's going to, the compiler is going to, and you can see this if you decompile one of these classes, it's going to convert that property into a real field of the same type, and it's going to be private. It's going to create a getter and a setter. That's pretty cool. And the benefit of that, obviously, is that um, in a Java library can access your stuff, uh, and it doesn't need to know about properties, and it can't know about properties, right, because it's a, it's a groovy concept. So in, uh, from Java side, you can, you can call a setter or call the getter. And... Uh, that's really cool because if later on you want to add in logic in the getter or the setter or both, you can create your own getter or setter. And then the Groovy compiler, if you created a getter or a setter or both, it won't overwrite yours. It'll only fill in the missing ones. So that's really nice because in, um, from your Groovy code, you'll probably still access, you wouldn't call the setter, you'd, call, you'd access the property and you'd set its value or you'd get the property. And under the hood, it's going to call the getter or call the setter for you. So now the logic for doing whatever checks need to made, made, be made when you're setting or getting are going to be done. And the same thing on the, on the Java side. So we add in a, a setter that has logic in it, and you, were, you had to use the setter before. It used to be just empty. It would just set the property. And now it does the logic and then sets the property or does whatever. So it's it's nice uh, forwards compatible kind of a concept. So that only happens if you do not have a scope modifier. So if you say private protected... Um, there is no way without an annotation to use package scope, so public is uh, uh, default. But if, if you say public string first name, it's not a property. It's a public field, and it won't be persistent. You, you probably, when you first started using uh, uh, Grails, you may have done that. You may have said your, your properties are public, and then it, it doesn't end up creating a column in the database, and it's not a, it's not a domain class property. It's, it's a, it's, it's, um, because that conversion doesn't happen when you explicitly say it's public. It's only when you default to nothing. So why does that matter for constants? It does the same thing for statics. So if I say static final string foo equals whatever, then it's going to create a get foo and a set foo. Because that's what it does. There's no scope modifier here. It's static, but that's not scope. That's, that's a static or instance. So if I, but if I say public, then it doesn't create the getter or the setter. Not a big deal. Um, but it looks weird if you uh, decompile the class and you see all these weird static getters for your, your uh, properties. And Ken Cousin was the one who, who uh, mentioned that. Um. Okay, another quiz. Do I need to add the click count property property to, these tr to the transients? Show of hands, who thinks I need that? So I want name to be persistent. I want a column for name in the database. I want that to be a persistent um, property. Um, but I want to just have a method that has a getter that looks like a property so that, you know, for, for non-persistent database access. Anybody think that I need that to be in the transients? In earlier versions of Grails, you did. Um, but it was a bug, and I fixed it. Um, in new Grails... Current Grails uh, 2.0, I don't know anything about Grails 3, sadly, but <laughs> I will soon. Uh, but it, um, in, uh, in modern Grails 2.0 and, and above, you do not need that to be in the transients list because it's not a property. I'll come back to that in a sec. I'll come back to that, why that is. So how about this one? If it's setter. So the other one was a getter. Do I, if I have just a setter, do I need the, it in the transients? Nope. Same thing. It's not a property yet. Old versions of Grails you did. New versions you don't. You only need it in this case. Because now we've created a property. Because this is basically Java Bean. It's not full Java Bean. Um, but the Java Bean, um, the general Java Bean pattern is empty constructor and getters and setters and a getter setter pair that have the same, that match on type and match on name. So the getter returns an, uh, one, the type that the setter accepts and the setter is void and they have the same core name. If you take off the get and the set and you lowercase the C, then, the, 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 then that creates a click count property. And if I don't want that to be persistent to the database, then I do have to add that to the transients list. So again, this is, this is me saying, please delete the transient thing because it's just cluttering the domain, domain class. That doesn't hurt anything, but it doesn't help you either. Same thing here, but here we need it 
because otherwise it's going to try to look for a column and it's going to fail and it's going to blow up on us. So it's kind of interesting because the reason that that is problematic, it's not a big problem, but the reason that that's problematic is that the way that Hibernate knows to work with the name as a persistent property is that the Groovy compiler created, because Hibernate doesn't know anything about Groovy properties, right? Doesn't know anything about Groovy. Just knows Java and bytecode and classes and methods and things like that. So the reason that that uh, name is visible to Hibernate and used by Hibernate is because it's got a get name and a set name property uh, setter pair. That's what Hibernate sees. It doesn't see the, the string name because it doesn't exist. Uh, and, the, and the field is private. So when we, whether we uh, have a get name and a set name that's automatically created for us by the Groovy compiler or, when, or we manually create it ourselves, in either case, we've created a property, Hibernate sees it and tries to work with it and will fail in that for the, for the click count. So yeah, definitely uh, I highly recommend spending lots of time in, with a decompiler because um, it's really, really fun in general, uh, I think. One of the first things I ever did years and years ago, a million years ago, when I, I went to a uh, no, fluff, just con just fluff, no Fluff Just Stuff conference, and uh, this was way back before Groovy 1.0, and uh, it, it was just completely eye-opening for me. My, my brain just about exploded. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and I had to see under the hood, how is, this, how is this possible? And so I decompiled and decompiled, and I still do that all the time because it's really fascinating. And if you look, especially, I'm going a little bit off topic here, but decompile a domain class. It's staggering how much stuff is in there. If you create a simple domain class like this, with just a single property, it's got 100, more than 100 methods in there. It's crazy, tons and tons of code, miles of code, because the AST transformations are adding in all those uh, GORE methods. Um, and a bunch of other stuff too. It's, it's really, really fascinating. Really cool stuff, I think. All right, I'm gonna blast through this one really quick. So um, you can create your own um, templates for um, domain classes and controllers and services and all that stuff. You just run Grails install templates. You can edit WebXML there. You can create your own templates. So then when you, cre when you run Grails create domain class or create controller or whatever, it's gonna use your templates instead of the, one, the default ones. But what if you wanted to create custom build config.groovies and data source.groovies? Because when I, like I said, I'm creating test apps all the time. And I just get really sick of manually uh, edit, making the same edits in, the, in, the, uh, in those uh, grails.conf files. So I wanted a way to be able to have my own set of uh, templates. So in 2.3, the last uh, Grails version that I really worked on, um, I added support for this and I didn't end up adding it to the, to the documentation. Um, so there is a way to extract out the templates, they're kind of hidden, um, create your own and set them in a, in a certain location, in the right location, and then Grails will see those are there and will use yours instead. So the uh, best place for this, I, I did a, someone asked about this on Stack Overflow, so I did a very long ex explanation of what's going on there. So if you click through to la that link, it'll show you how to do that. And then uh, exceptions. So I'm gonna stop here, because I'm running out of time, but be really careful with exceptions. Exceptions are really expensive. And they're insanely expensive in Groovy because we've all seen six mile long stack traces, right? Groovy makes big ass exception stack traces. And Grails hides a lot of that because we filter out a lot of the, the junk that doesn't really help you much. But it's still there, we just kind of, it was created and then we, we, we streamed it out. So use exceptions for exceptional cases. Um, so what the, the biggest uh, offender here is fail and error true. You almost never want to use fail and error true. Most of you probably use it because you love it, right? It throws an exception and it tells you that something terrible happened. But it's, if you look at these, these, this code, and um, it's almost the same code, right? Looks the same. So if I use the has errors check, or I use a try catch, it's the same basic thing. I've got a success block and a failure block. The difference though is that the first one has almost no, there's no ex excess performance hit. Second one, has incurs that cost of creating uh, unnecessary exceptions, because that exception is not exceptional. And you're not gonna look at the stack trace. All you're gonna do is you're gonna use the errors object to then find out what failed and fix it, and then report to the user what failed, or fix it, fix it yourself. And you can really easily do that in that first block. So these are except basically the same code, except one of them is gonna slow your app down unnecessarily. Grail sucks, why is it so slow? And the other one doesn't suck. So use the first one. Don't use fail and error true. 
The only time you ever want to use trail and error true is when you're, it, like in Bootstrap, if you're creating data or in tests, in integration tests, when you're creating uh, seed data and you're, t you're typing out the values and you know that they're correct because you, you, you're doing them. And so it's a nice sort of double check that if something in the future happens, I want to have that, that blow up and, and fail on me very uh, uh, loudly. But in your controllers, in your services, things, things like that, you have to assume that people are going to make mistakes. People are going to type the wrong password. Hackers are going to use a, an invalid password. So don't use an exception for validation errors unless it really makes sense. And then there's two really fascinating articles that have nothing to do with, they don't reference Groovy at all. So take the really scary stuff information in there, uh, in both of those articles, and then turn it up to 11 because Groovy makes it even worse. So read both of those, those, those links. Uh, it'll give you real numbers about the incredible expense of creating unnecessary exceptions. So I did this talk at Greech, um, and so I'm not going to put these slides up because they're basically the same, so, but I have a link here to the slides if you want to download them. You can watch the video of that. It, it, it's obviously a different version of the talk than this one. Um, and you can buy my book. I know it's only June, but it's never too uh, early to start thinking about stocking stuffers and, and uh, buying a copy of the book for your mom or whatever. So there's a code in here, off D, it'll give you a, it'll save 40%. Uh, so thank you.